Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Genesis. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're going to start today <clears throat> with verse 15, as we basically ended last week with verse 15. <clears throat> A new world has awaited Noah and his family. The flood is over. The waters have receded. The earth is now dry, as we see in verse 15. <clears throat> the old world has literally washed away, and the silt of the world has now gathered together and buried in layers this world that we call the Andaluvian world. It's gone. That world that existed before the flood, folks, this is a world that you and I had never known. <clears throat> this was a world of danger. This was a world of darkness. This was a world of, of diabolical hideousness that, that God looked upon it and said, it has made me ill that I have even made man. It grieved me, God said, that I made man, and so therefore he destroyed it. The flood waters had abated, and the day had arrived to possess that which God had cleansed. The people that were inside the ark, Noah, his three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, their three wives and the wife of Noah were ready. Imagine <clears throat> 371 days in the ark. Imagine a year and 17 days <clears throat> in an RV that floated on the water. Imagine if you think you had claustrophobia now, what it would have been like after a year and 17 days. A new dispensation of man was about to begin. Noah was getting ready to go out of the ark and God was going to ask him to possess the land and to multiply upon the face of the earth and a new world was going to dawn and a new age had come upon this world and this world was now in the dispensation or the new age of government. God was no longer going to rely upon the consciousness of man. That man's conscience could be seared. Man's conscience could be affected by sin. <clears throat> Excuse me. So God had decided that he would go in a different route. Though faith would be required of man, faith would still be the element that would bring man to a saving knowledge of God. However, God saw that the way that man would relate to him would be in a different era, era. And so God brought forth this man named Noah as the first of the great patriarchs that came upon the earth. He bridged the world of the Andalusian world and the world of the patriarchs together. And so this new world was about ready to dawn. This new dis dis dispensation began with a very simple mandate to mankind. God said to Noah in very simple terms, go. Now, folks, that's a very important word for us, <clears throat> not only in Noah's time, but it was an important word for us in our time, that it was the same mandate that Jesus gave us when he left this world and began a new dispensation, not of law, but of grace, and he said to the church, go. And that was the word for the church. And folks, that word is very important because, you see, mankind has taken that simple mandate of go, and we have said things like, where? <laughs> go where? Now, of all people on the earth, Noah would have been the one to ask where, wouldn't he? God would have said, go, and Noah said, where? There is no place to go. There is no McDonald's. There is no mall. There is no restaurant. There is no ball game. There is nothing, God. What am I to go to? But we see here in our, our message today, this new beginning had a very important beginning. And it began with the simple word, go. Let's, let's read our text and then we'll pray. We start here in verse 15. And then God spoke to Noah saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and cattle, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, so that they may 
may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wives and his sons' wives with him. And every animal, every creeping thing, every bird and whatever creeps on the earth, according to their families, went out of the ark. And then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. And then the Lord said to his, or excuse me, in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Nor will I again destroy everything as I have done. While the earth remains seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer and day and night shall not cease. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. And, oh, Father, how important it is in each and every life here today. And how important it was for Noah that your word go was there for him, Father. And your word go is there for us, too. And that, Father, as we read your word and as we contemplate on your word and as we search your word, let your Holy Spirit be our teacher. Let your Holy Spirit be our guide. And Father God, as he speaks to us your words of wisdom, and as he speaks to us your words of life, let our hearts be open to receive his message. Let our hearts be open to receive the news that we need this day and this coming week. And oh, Father God, we ask that you be with us, that our hearts might be made glad, and that we might leave this place, Father, knowing that it was good to be in the house of the Lord and be with our friends. And Father, be with our brothers and sisters all over the world that are under persecution, who cannot come into a house of God like this, who cannot come into the presence of a preaching and teaching ministry, Father, but are scorned and hidden and hiding in places, Father, where they cannot be found. Oh, be with them encourage them and especially those who have been put in prison and those who are persecuted for their faith oh lord would our hearts be joined to them that we might bless them with our prayers for it is in jesus name we pray amen we see in verses 15 through 19 in our text this morning the lord's mandate of appropriation God said to Noah, go, and it was not a directional as much as it was a deed thing. God said, I want you to go out and I want you to possess the world. I want you to go out and I want you to reach the world now, a brand new start, a brand new beginning, a brand new life. And I want you to go out and I want you to affect the world with your life. I want you to do things that will make the world to be changed in the likeness of how I would want it to be. Not like it was before, full of violence and sin and horror. But we see here in verse 15 through 17, his commission of predominance. God said in his intercession of God here in verse 15, he said, I want you to go. Now the Bible says very simply in verse 15, and the Lord spoke to Noah, or excuse me, then the Lord spoke to Noah. Then, what happened? Look at verse 14. And in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dry. The earth was ready to be possessed. The earth was ready to be taken care of. And the Bible says God spoke to Noah. Does God speak to you? Preacher, I don't hear voices. (laughs) I hope you don't. (laughs) The bottom line is God does speak to us today. You say, well, I've never heard the voice of God. That's because you don't read the Bible. You read the Bible and God speaks to you through the word. The Holy Spirit applies to the truth of it to your life. There are many times, beloved, that I have read the Bible and as I read the Bible, I said, I've never heard that before. Or I've, that's never dawned on me before. It's there, plain as sight, in front of me, and I have never done that because that's the ministry of of the Holy Spirit for the believer as they read the Bible. 
we see here the Bible says that God spoke to Noah. Spoke to him three times already. Up until now, the first time he spoke to him was in Genesis 6. And he said, go build an ark. He said, I'm going to destroy the world. Judgment is coming. And you need to go build an ark. And Noah began to build the ark. He was obedient. The second time, by the way, the Bible does not say that God spoke to Noah's wife. The Bible does not say that God spoke to the three sons of Noah or to his daughter-in-laws. Their, their trip on the ark was not based on that they heard the voice of God, but rather they believed the faith of Noah. And it was not salvation to them that they believed the faith of Noah, but it was that they believed the faith of Noah's message in that Noah told them judgment was coming because God had told him. Folks, it is our responsibility to be as Noah and to share with people the judgment that's coming in the word of God. And we see here the Bible says that he told them about the judgment. And then in verse 6 he says, make an ark. The second time he spoke to Noah was in Genesis chapter 7, a hundred and some years later. That's a long time to hear somebody's voice, isn't it? A hundred and some years later, Noah is putting the finishing touches on the ark and God says to Noah, go into the ark. Or excuse me, come into the ark. God says, come into the ark where I am. Come on in now. It's time to possess the ark. And so Noah went in. The third that time he spoke to Noah was here in our eighth chapter where he says, go out of the ark. Go out of the ark. We see the God of mercy. We see the God of mercy here in verse 15. What do you mean, pastor? Well, excuse me, not in verse 15, but in, in uh, chapter 7 and verse 1. The God of mercy in Genesis chapter 7 and verse 1, the name is changed. You say, what do you mean the name is changed? Mine says God, just like it says God here in verse 8. But you see, in the Hebrew text, which is very interesting, because the Hebrew uses different names for God to represent what his meaning for the text is. So, for example, here in Genesis chapter 7 and verse 1, the Bible says, Then the Lord said to Noah, and that word Lord there is Hashem. And that word Hashem means the merciful God. And so it was the merciful God who said in verse 1 of chapter 7, come into the ark. It was the sovereign God of Elohim in chapter 6 who said judgment is coming. And now we see once more here in verse 15 the God of might. In verse 15, the Bible says, Then God spoke to Noah. The word there again, once more, is Elohim, meaning it is the sovereign God. He's saying to Noah, Now, not mercy, but my sovereign will is that you leave this ark. That you leave this ark. So here in verse 15, God denotes supremacy. The earth is ready, but the sovereign decree is to go. Now the question is, will man obey? And you see, that's the issue in life, is it not? It's in the issues of life of the Christian today. It's the issue of life of the lost person. Is God sovereign in your life? If God would say, go, would you go? Oh, beloved, I, I, when God told me to go and God called me into the ministry, I fought him for over a year. I was working in a major university. I was having my life the way I wanted it. I was going down the road, doing my own thing. And God knocked on my door one day and said, I want you to preach. And I said, well, here I am. Send somebody else. I'm, I'm happy as I am, happy as a clam, to be exact. <clears throat> God took me on a couple Jonah rides, and guess what? I was willing to say, here am I. Send me. But we have to be willing to go. Now, not all of us are called into the ministry, but all of us are called by God to accomplish what God would have you accomplish in your life. You say, Pastor, what's God's will for my life? Well, I'll tell you what I know about what God's will for your life is. First of all, is to be saved if you're lost. Secondly, if you're saved, live for Him. I know that's God's will for you. Now, the rest of it, you're going to have to find out yourself. I don't know. I, I am not the Holy Spirit in your life. I can't tell you exactly what God's will is. I can share with you what the Bible says God's will is. But sometimes, folks, that's very general. God did not tell me to marry my wife. 
He didn't put her name in my Bible and say, John, you will marry Deborah on June 28, 1974. Didn't say that. But God told me what a beautiful, lovely woman of God was like. And I checked my wife out with that scripture. And guess what? She fit. And I said, man, if it's good enough for God, it's good enough for me. Well, the bottom line, that's how you, folks, you have to find out what God's will for your life is. And you need to accomplish it. Too many people are willing to, to come to church and say, preacher, thrill me. Thrill me. Entertain me. And folks, uh, that's great for a short time. But it doesn't meet the need of the soul. And God said to Noah, go. And that was God's will. And Noah had a choice. We see the instruction of God in verse 16 and 17. Look at the command of removal in verse 16 and 17a. In verse 16, the Bible says, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and cattle and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Okay? Command of removal. God was first in the ark. Dr. Phillips says, God was first in the ark and the last to leave. His boots were the first one on the ground when, when, when he went in the ark and the, the last one to come off the ark, so to speak. He says, go. Go out. And then he gave him a command to replenish. Look at verse 17, the last part. And be fruitful and multiply on the earth. That was for the animals. This command comes later from man in, verse, in chapter 9. We'll see this later. The Jewish commentary says there's a dual meaning in the Hebrew in this text. When Noah here in verse 17, the Bible says, bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you. And then the Bible says, go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. That the actual Hebrew text here means this. It's a dual meaning. He says to order them out. <laughs> You're going to evict them out, Noah. Go in there and tell your family, this isn't our home anymore. And then you're going to go in and tell the birds and the bees and you're going to tell the, 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 all the animals, the giraffes and all those people, you're going to say, animals, you're going to say to them, this is not your home anymore. And if they will not go, the dual meaning is, no, you're to drive them out. And that's pretty tough, isn't it? He says, no, if they will not go, then you need to drive them out. They must leave. This is the will of God. Why is this? Folks, man was never meant to live in the church building. Man was never meant to live in a church building, to fellowship 24-7, so that we could be the most fit Christian of all. Folks, we don't come here to exercise. We come here to recuperate. Huh? Many of us are hurting Many of us have gone through a tough week. Some of you have gone through the worst week of your life and you come to church and you don't need somebody coming up and say, okay, let's go up and down, up and down. Let's, let's have a good time. You need somebody to say, come on, let's go. Let's get out and let's conquer this world. Let's live for Christ. Let's do more for him tomorrow. Not because we, we have anything else better to do. Because it's the right thing to do. Go, the Bible says. Because it's the right thing to do. Look at verse 18 and 19, the compliance of the patriarchs. In verse 13, 18, so Noah went out. Noah was the first. Noah went outside and he says, come on. Noah went outside and with, with, the, with the mandate of doing this, if Noah would have went out and his family would have stayed in, Noah would have gone in and chased them out. That's the whole idea. But Noah, the Bible says, here in verse 18, so Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his son's wife with him. They all came out. And that's a good thing, by the way. We see Noah's companions disembark from the, from the ark in verse 18. Look at the family. The families come out. Do you realize the family had fears? You know, we have a problem sometimes when we read the Bible. We look at them and we say, well, I could never be like them. They're in the Bible. You know, they're superhuman people. 
They're not like me. They, they, they don't have a world like me. They don't live like me. They, they, they don't have fears like I have. Preacher, they've never lived like I've lived. That may be true, but folks, they're just like you. Surely the family would have had some doubts. Surely the family would have had some fears. What if the flood would come back? It had been raining perhaps off and on. Clouds going by. Thunder, lightning perhaps down far off somewhere. Sometimes you can see that. If you have flat enough land, you can look off and see the rain afar off. Could have been a tornado far off or something. We don't know. Would there be enough provisions? God wiped out everything. How are we going to eat? Wife may have said, I have nothing to wear. We don't know what fears the family had here. How are we going to live? You see, they had to trust by faith God's man. They had to trust by faith the patriarch Noah. This is a new dispensation. They had to come and say, this is a man who has spoke with God and we must believe him. They didn't have a Bible. Their faith was in God's man as Noah had faith in God. Now let me say this to you. We're in a different dispensation. You need to have faith in God. You have right before you on your lap the word of God. You read it. Don't rely on me to preach this to you every week. Folks, you ought to be reading this to the point that you can come up here and preach this. But the bottom line is, this is what we trust in. Noah didn't have a Bible. He had the word of God, though. And he went to his family and he stepped out of the ark and he said, family, the word of God is go. And they went. Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Noah trusted God. But look at the family's faithfulness. They did go. They did go. The Bible tells us they left. Again, remember, it was Noah's faith that convinced them. It was Noah's faith. They did not hear the, the voice of God. They did not hear the voice of God. They relied upon Noah's word. They didn't hear him. The new dispensation of government was given, and they believed. Mark eleven twenty two. 22. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. Have faith in God. You say, preacher, you don't know what I've gone through. Have faith in God. You don't know what I'm going through now. Have faith in God. I want to start a new life. I want to start anew. But I don't know all the answers. I don't know all the things. I, I have some doubts. I have some fears. I don't believe like I need to believe. Have faith in God. What's the Bible say, preacher? The Bible says in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, in verse 6, the first part says this, without faith, it is impossible to please him. I've got to know it right up in my face. I've got to see it right here. I've got to have it right in my hands to know it and believe it. Then you're in trouble because life isn't that way. Life is never that way. Life has never been that way. I don't know why we expect it to be that way. I don't know why we demand it to be that way. When in reality, the truth is simple. Have faith in God. We see in verse 19, Noah's creatures disembark. Noah tells the animals, go. <laughs> and they went. They left according to their keeper. Look at verse 19 again. And every animal, every creeping thing, every bird and whatever creeps on the earth, according to their families, went out of the ark. Noah didn't have to go in. He didn't have to drive them out. He stepped outside and said, come on, little birdies. Come on, little, little lambs. And they all came out. They left according to their keeper. But then they also left according to their kind. Now, in my, in my new King James Version, it says here in verse 19 that according to their families. And that's kind of neat. And that's kind of nice. The original King James Version says after their kind. And that's very interesting. Why is that, Pastor? Because kinds is very important. It's how God made them. 
That's why I don't believe in evolution. That's why I don't believe that man evolved. As a Christian, I can't believe that. Because the Bible says he made them after their kind. See, evolution says they all came from one kind. That's what evolution proposes. Everything came from one kind. And we talked about that several months ago when we were in the first part of Genesis. It didn't come from one kind. They came from every kind. So all the little doggies came from their kind. And all the little kitties came from their kind. Folks, the word is variance. The word is variety. We have a variety of dogs because God put it in their DNA to have a variety of dogs. I saw a picture the other day of, of a white couple that had twins. One was black and one was white. How was this? How did this happen? How in the world could something like this happen? It's called the variance of DNA, folks. The Bible says we all were coming from this point that God created us from our kind and we, through variety, we had the different dogs, we have the different cats, we have the different horses, all of that. It wasn't like evolution says. They're wrong. It's a lie, folks. You didn't start out by pond scum. It didn't start out because some alien decided to toss his Burger King bag on the, on the, the earth so it would grow out, a little, out of pond scum as one cell one cell amoeba grew out. Folks, Darwin was wrong. The one cell is not a simple cell. The one cell of any cell is completely complex because it was made by a complex being. It was made by God. We could never evolve from one cell. We have our kind. That's why the monkeys are the monkeys and the giraffes are the giraffes. And the lions are the lions, and the bears are the bears, and then there's football. <laughs> no wonder we're confused, huh? We see they left according to their kind. But look, we see the Lord's mandate of assurance here also. We see his, his mandate of appropriation. Get out of the ark and possess the land. Go, God said. But here we see in verse 20 through 22, the Lord's mandate of assurance. He knew the family was having troubles. Maybe you have trouble believing. Maybe you have trouble having faith in what God has for you. Maybe you have a little trouble doubting. We all have had that. We've all gone through that. that that's simple. That's a simple thing, folks. That, that, that's just understandable. That's human nature to have doubts. God wanted to take this family that obviously had doubts. Every woman on the face of the earth, how are we going to make it? Noah's wife was no different. And so we see God brought his assurance to them. Look at verse 20. We see the reverence of those saved. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird, offered burnt offerings on the altar. We see Noah's altar of devotion here. Again, God's name used here is Hashem in verse, in verse 20. And the Lord built, Noah built an altar to Hashem, the God of mercy. He went there and built this altar. And by the way, this is the first time that the altar is mentioned. We'll talk about that in a second. This is the first time in the Bible that altar is mentioned. Is this the first time sacrifice is? No. You see, they had altars before. Cain had an altar that he put all his little filly flowers and his little, little wheat and all that stuff on. Abel had an altar that he had slain his lamb and put it upon. God had an altar for Adam and Eve when he had gave them skins of animals. It is shown that he, has, he provided a sacrifice for them. And here Noah remembered Remember last week we talked about this in verse seven, the or verse first part of verse eight, the verse one, the uh, chapter eight, excuse me, that said that God remembered Noah. Well, not that God forgot him, but we see here that God remembered. Now Noah remembers. Noah says, "The way I come to God in worship, the way I come to God in forgiveness, is through the blood sacrifice." And so he took all the clean animals. One of every kind that he had, extra, remember, he took on board. And he sacrificed them. Why? Because first we see his thankfulness for God's provision, or God's providence, excuse me. 
God's providence. God gave him an ark. You know what I think the problem of most Christians are today? They have forgotten that God saved them. Really, I honestly do. I think sometimes we forget. We get saved and we stand there at the foot of the cross and we're overwhelmed by the love. We're overwhelmed by the mercy. We're overwhelmed by the grace. Many of us have an absolute unbelievable experience at salvation. And we walk down the road every once in a while occasionally looking back at the cross and saying, oh Lord, you saved me. But many times as we've grown older, as many of us have been Christians for many years, we forget to look back to the cross. We forget where we came from. We forget that day that God saved us. We see that Noah was not forgetful of the ark. You see, the ark is Noah's cross, is it not? It was the cross that, that Noah clung to. Oh, I wonder how many times when Noah lived past the ark, many years past the ark, that he must have looked there on the Mount Ararat, far off now, way down from the valley, looking up there to Mount Ararat, must have said, oh, if I could but just touch the ark once more. I'd have that joy, that thrill of salvation, that thrill of glory that God has given me. But oh, beloved, there are many times as Christians, we too big, we're too busy to look back at the cross. But Noah had a thankfulness for God's providence, the ark, his thankfulness for God's protection from the flood. Oh God, you saved me. Oh God, you saved my family. And then we see his thankfulness for God's provision. Oh God, look at this new life you've given me. God, you could have left me in the ark forever. But you gave me a new life to live. By the way, let me say this in a way of, of note. This is extra on sidebar for you. A thankful heart is a worshiping heart. Again, I think one of the biggest problems of Christians today is we have ceased being thankful. We have ceased being thankful for what God has done for us. A heart that wants to be at God's house. A heart that wants to lead the family in thanksgiving. A heart that wants to, to live for God. Who takes away that thanksgiving? Oh, I think it's when the world tells us, we gave you this. When the boss tells you, I've given you a paycheck when you worked for it all week long. When people have told you, I gave you that diploma. I've given you this and I've given you that. Oh, when you sit back in yourself and look, look what I've provided for me, when in reality God gave us the ability for it all. God gave you the ability to even think. God gave you the ability to work. God gave you the ability to think and work and do your work at school, young people. God gave you the ability to do all of that. And lo and behold, we ought to be thankful. When I was young, I used to have to do a lot of work in, in my undergraduate work. We had to do a lot of volunteer work. I had to go to a lot of places like nursing homes and different other places to go to. And my undergraduate work is in counseling, so I had to do all of that. One thing I always found out when I left, I was so glad I was able to leave. I was thankful. I many times said, God, thank you that I've got two good legs that I can walk away from this building. Thank you, Lord, that I've got two good eyes that I can see. Thank you, Lord, that I've got a, a voice that I can speak. One day I may not have those things. One day I may be in that nursing home. One day I may be in, in trouble. But, oh, beloved, my mind hopefully will be able to say, Thank you, Lord, for all that you've given me. We see here Noah's thankfulness, his altar of devotion. But look at Noah's altar of designation. Again, it was the first time that the word altar is mentioned in the Bible. We see his construction of sacrifice. He made the altar. Again, look at verse 20. The Bible says that Noah built an altar. Do you notice God didn't say, come over here, Noah. I built something for you. Noah, I, God could have built the ark for Noah, couldn't he? Why did God say, Noah, I want you to build an ark? Why didn't God say, here, here's an ark I built for you, Noah. Get on board and go down the road. 
You know why I think Noah's ark had to be built by Noah and why Noah's altar had to be built by Noah? Because God wants us to be willing to worship and obey him. My life is rough, preacher. You don't know what I go through. I've got some tough times. Maybe so. I've always found somebody worse off than I am. When I get down in the old mully grubs and start thinking, oh, poor me, you know, look what I'm going through and all this and that, I, it just doesn't take long for God to say, look over here. And I find out, you know, my life isn't so bad after all. And God expects me to work on my life every day, just like Noah worked on the ark every day. And God expects me to come every Sunday to plop my body down here and to build an altar of worship for him every Sunday. God's not going to build it at my home and say, have at it. God expects me to do it as he expects you to. We see his construction of sacrifice. God wants you to sacrifice time. God wants you to sacrifice your ability. God wants you to sacrifice your love and your mercy for him. We see his choice of sacrifice. It was voluntary. It wasn't required. Anywhere in here do you see that God said, Noah, I want you to go out and sacrifice. Do you see that? Not in my Bible. It's not in yours either. Why, did, why, did God, why was God so pleased with this? Did you ever, you ever think of that in verse 21? Why is God so pleased? And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. It wasn't like barbecue time. Man, sometimes I'll get home and Deb's got something on the barbecue or, or Nathan's got something on the barbecue. And man, I'm saying, oh, I hope that's home. I hope that's home. That just smells so good. That's not what the Bible's talking about here. What the Bible says here, we see the choice of sacrifice. You see, it wasn't required. That's why it was so pleasing to God. Because Noah said, this is what I ought to do. If I want to come to you, God, this is what I need to do. And God says, you've pleased me, Noah. Wouldn't you like God to say of you one day, well done, thou good and faithful servant? Don't listen to this world. They're leading you down the road. They're teaching you God is not real. They're teaching you God is not not here, or God's some far off flung thing, or there is no God, or whatever. Folks, listen. Don't listen to the world. What's the world giving you? What's the world giving you that it doesn't take away? We see here his consensus of sacrifice. He used the right animals, and this pleased God too. You see, when you sacrifice to God, you got to do it the right way. You can't be like Cain. You can't just do your thing. Oh, God, I'll worship you here on the lake, or I'll worship you here on the, uh, at work, or I'll worship you here and there. You know, folks, we can worship God anywhere, but the bottom line is you come to worship in, in sacrifice. Here is the place. So how did Noah know to get these animals? How did Noah know this? Because it had been taught to him before. You know what? God says to the church of Ephesians, go back and do what you used to do at the beginning. You know what the answer for Christians is? I, I'm not living my life, preacher. I, I, I'm not joyful. I have no joy in my life. I'm not, I'm not e experiencing anything good in my life. I, I'm a born-again Christian, but I don't have that joy anymore. You know what the Lord says? Go back and do what you used to do in the beginning. That's what Noah did. Noah said, I'm going to do what I used to do before the flood. And that's why God looked at Noah and said, oh, and Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. We see in verse 21 and 22 the response of the sovereign. The gloriousness of the Lord in verse 21. The Lord's pleasing. The Lord's pleasure. That's what he smelled. He smelled the aroma of worship. He didn't smell the aroma of a little burning lamb. He didn't smell the aroma of some little burning dove or whatever. Or a calf or a cow. The Bible says here that God was pleased because he smelled the smell of worship. The aroma of worship. What's your life like? You say, what do you smell like? Well, preacher, that's kind of personal, isn't it? Well, let me get a little personal. I'm not asking about what aftershave or cologne or perfume you spray on your body. 
I'm asking you, what's your worship aroma like? Do you worship God every day? Don't you worship God in love and grace? Don't you worship God as you drive down the road? Don't you worship God as you go to work? Don't you worship God as you go to school? Don't you worship God in every day of your life? And then you come here in this place and this time and you've worshiped all week long. No wonder you're ready to start the week out worshiping like you're supposed to. We see the gloriousness of God, his pleasure, his promise. What did God speak? Look at verse 21. The Bible says, the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. And then the Lord said to his, in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. We see the promise. God said, I'm not going to destroy the world by flood anymore. You know, God has certain promises for you, and you're never going to realize until you begin to worship. You say, I don't understand why God, God feels so far away. Worship. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, Jesus said. That's what you need to do if you want to be in God's pleasure and to receive God's promise. Look at the Lord's perspective. What God saw, he saw the depravity of man. He said man is going to be depraved from his birth. You didn't have to teach your children how to lie. You don't sit down with your little, little crumb cruncher and say, now this is how you lie to mommy. This is how you lie to daddy. This is how you do wrong. I never had to teach my children, had to teach them how to do right. I like the way Dr. Dobson says they're all a bunch of little pagans and you have to cure them. You have to basically train them to be, to be, to live among societal people, you know. The bottom line is they're little, they're little sinners. Verse 22, we see the guarantee of the Lord. We see the credence of God's promise in verse 22. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night, shall not cease. As long as it's harvest time, as long as it's summer, as long as it's spring, folks, we know that God's promise is never to destroy us. I'm sorry, environmentalists, but they are wrong. I believe we ought to take care of the earth, and I believe we have a responsibility not to pollute the earth. I do believe that. But folks, listen, they're wrong when they say that we're going to destroy the world. We're not going to. God's already promised us here that he would never destroy the world by flood again. Now, one day he's going to, I do believe in global warming, one day he's going to burn the world up and he's going to make it anew. But the bottom line is, folks, we won't destroy it. You and I can't do it. So we can trust God when we wake up in the morning. Today's not the day that everything's going to be destroyed because God's promised you. And God has promises you for you folks every day if you'll wake up and listen and read and get in God's word. God's promises will take you through the day. God's promises will get you through the week. Noah gave sacrifice and God said, oh, I am so pleased. And that's why his life was filled with wonder and strength. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, Father, for your love and your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Father, that you gave us your promise. You gave us strength that we might live and worship and worship you, Father, in spirit and truth. And Father, there might be someone here today that does not know Jesus as their Savior. You speak to their heart today, right now. You speak to their heart and say to them that they need Jesus. Have them come down and take me by the hand and say, Preacher, I want Jesus in my heart today. And we'll show them, Father, in the Bible how they can have that. There might be someone who needs to come and join the church or someone who needs to be baptized or whatever decision needs to be made, Father, they may need to come and pray. Whatever decision, let them come. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us, and we'd like to have some feedback. 
let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday.